Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace. Good morning, or almost good afternoon to everybody. How is everybody doing? Still morning. How is everybody doing? Wonderful. Welcome. It's wonderful to see this um, conference room filled with wonderful faces and smiles. I typically hear teaching a women's class on Friday evenings that is also filled almost to the brim every Friday evening of Muslim women, but it's wonderful to see all different types of people here today, and I really welcome you. Thank you so much for being here, and I'm honored to be addressing you today. The topic I was given was on the spiritual transformation and healing of the Hajj. And with that, I wanted to share just a few thoughts in the short time that we have, um, and really speak to you about the process that a Muslim takes, getting themselves ready to go to this Hajj. Because even in the prerequisites of how you even make the decision of when in your lifetime to go to the Hajj, because it's mandatory once in a lifetime, if possible, even coming to that decision and figuring out the prerequisites is in itself a journey, a curative, and even healing journey. So if we think about the Hajj, right, this pilgrimage to visiting the house of God, Many people consider the Hajj to be the peak of a person's spiritual life. That after you come back from the Hajj, you've been transformed in many ways. And we have countless accounts of people who have been truly transformed, and later today we'll be hearing the story of Malcolm X and his transformation that the Hajj did for him. But this story is repeated many fold, and for so many people. And if we think about what it does in terms of nations and large numbers of people beyond just the individual, there is also a transformative process amongst people as well. Because in order to go to Hajj, you literally have to shed aside everything that identifies you or makes you unique. Your culture, your language, your social status, your education. Everything that you identify yourself with is shed when you go to Hajj. The prerequisites to go to Hajj require you to figure out who you might have angered and make that right. Before people go to Hajj, they literally send out messages, and I've received many of these from friends and family before they go to Hajj that say, please forgive me if I have done anything. And often I'll receive these messages and say, I haven't done anything. <laughs> but, I forgive you nonetheless, because a person going off to Hajj wants to make sure that there is nothing that will be a barrier holding them back from really experiencing the divine. Also, if you have any debts of any sort, they must be repaid, or at least forgiven or put on some sort of payment plan for when you come back. That too is a huge prerequisite, right? And you also have to figure out if it is the right time and place to travel. I've thought about this personally, and many times I have young children. And is it the right time for me to break away for a couple of weeks and leave my children behind? And with whom? And are they safe? And will they be okay? And so on. <coughs> Yet at the same time, you want to be healthy and able to really take on the journey of Hajj. So waiting until you're much older may not be the right decision either. You also have to be financially stable. But the requirement is that you're just barely financially stable. So you don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be have lots of expendable wealth. But rather that you have met some basic stable requirements for yourself and your family. And beyond that, you should go. So the timing is actually very interesting. And the sitting with yourself to figure out, is it the right time? is really a curative process to figure out whether you have angered anyone or owe anything to anyone or whether this is the right time in your life to take on this journey. Just the sitting with yourself helps you tune into the vast and the divine. Right? And from there, then we just keep on going. So maybe we've decided we've reached that point in our life. Now it's this process of going to the house. And what happens at the point of Hajj, and many Muslims will call Hajj the utopian state of humans on earth. It is the place where all are equal, where you literally have to be, where you literally have to shed everything that makes you unique, as we said before. And that might mean 
that you're going to make sure that you are shoulder to shoulder with the next person and you don't know what their original journey was. You don't know if they're wealthier than you, more educated than you, have a social, higher social status than you, or lower, or higher, or equal to you. But rather, you are all there, shoulder to shoulder, equal in the sight of God. That in itself, for human beings, and being somebody who studies psychology, right? For the psychology of a human, and humans, right? That is really, truly curative. Because if we're able to transcend the differences between us, then we're really able to figure out, as nations and tribes, how we're going to actually go along properly. And so, as we go forward in this process, we realize that to be able to cleanse ourselves before going to Hajj means shedding all the pettiness, all the worldly matters that constrict our hearts and our minds. Because if we're really going to really understand Hajj, and we probably should understand it in the context of the five pillars of the sun, and I'll just very quickly and briefly go through them, that the oneness of God, or the belief in the oneness of God, the Shahada, is where it's fundamental, and is where one person starts in their journey of Islam. The prayers regulates a believer's relationship with God. It is the daily connection that we have with God as Muslims. One of my spiritual teachers called uh, kind of referred to prayer as the merry-go-round. Life is kind of like the merry-go-round, round and round and round and round, dizzying <laughs> effect of your everyday life. And prayer is like putting that merry-go-round on pause. And suddenly everything shifts back into focus for a short while, and you connect back into what really matters, and then you jump back onto the merry-go-round. <laughs> and you do this five times a day to connect deeply with God, and to really remember what is important. But life goes on, right? So it regulates a believer's relationship with God, and I can probably spend the entire time speaking just on prayer, but we'll move on. Then we have the zakat, which regulates a person's relationship with society. Then you have fasting, which regulates and helps self-control and discipline, and many, many other things. But then we reach hedge as the final pillar of Islam, and here we realize that as one nation, which often we will call in Islamic terminology the Ummah, right, the one nation, that here we understand that the high principles and values that Islam really hopes to shape individuals and nations. This is what the Hajj's main function will be. But then let's talk about it in a more individualistic function. I'll talk about the core functions of Hajj as psychological, spiritual, moral, behavioral, self-control, and social functions of Hajj. And we'll go through those one by one, briefly, each briefly. So if we look at the psychological and spiritual function of the Hajj, we find that it is the exercise of the believer to really figure out on a day-to-day -day level, to push away their day-to-day -day preoccupations, and to really go on to a spiritual journey in their connection with God. And you start to understand this really deep and symbolic journey when you understand what, why people dress the way they dress on Hajj. And I referred to this earlier when he said it is for the men they wear two unsewn white garments. The same garments you otherwise would wear and only would wear a time of burial. When it's put in that context, you suddenly understand that everything that makes you unique no longer matters in this journey. And you dress this way, and you think about it, why are each of us dressed the way we're dressed? Sometimes it's cultural, cultural garb. Sometimes it's a, it's a uh, symbol of our education, of our wealth, of our status. A business suit signifies certain things, does it not? It shows a person's status, it shows maybe their position in a place. A warrior's t-shirt signifies something too, does it not? Hobbies, and the luxury to have the time to even have a hobby. True? When I wear my white coat with the Stanford emblem on it, it signifies something, does it not? Or even my fleece that says Stanford. It shows my education and shows my even prestige. True? Mm -hmm. Even this room, right, for the men and women of the cloth, 
robes of piety or robes of royalty. They too signify something. All of that has to be shed. All of it. So it does not matter where exactly you come from. What matters is the point at which you are right now and where you're headed in this journey to visit God's holy house and to go on this uh, transformation that the Hajj is meant to bring about. But it cannot happen if you have these barriers in place of worldly matters. Wealth, prestige, status, and so on. Secondly, we realize that in order to go onto the hedge, you really have to, you're going into a spiritual, we call this in the Arabic, the haram, a spiritual sanctuary, in which all things that otherwise are permitted are now not permitted in the state of the haram. Things that otherwise are permitted that are fine, like, you know, whatever it is that you want to wear, or typical actions that seem, like, that are everyday actions, but you're restricted in actually taking them on so that you can focus on tuning into the divine. Right? And that is in itself a difficult journey for some. And we won't go into the specifications of Islamic law of what's limited and what's not limited in this particular discussion, but just know that all these things that are typically normal are now going to be kind of put aside momentarily so that you can focus on the hajj. And in this way, we find that the, you're psychologically training yourself to really get something out of the hajj and transform. Secondly, if we look at the moral and behavioral function of the hajj, we see that where the hajj, the, the Muslims, our pilgrims, are meant to come from every distant corner of the earth and congregate in one place. And here they are at the sacred house, the Kaaba, with mutually unintelligible languages. I can't tell you the number of times where I have been here. And literally, we're just sort of motioning to each other because we can't understand each other. But what you can see is real love and desire. In Medina, the next city, there's not too many cities over from Mecca, where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is buried, and people visit there as well when they take this journey. Sitting at the gates waiting to enter, for the women, all of us together, waiting to enter for our visitation to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, women of every background in every language, and we cannot understand each other, but what is mutually intelligible are the tears. And in Arabic we say shafaqa, this kind of real desire and hope to meet the Prophet, peace be upon him, and to visit him, right? And although we can't understand each other, we're just motioning to each other, what does translate over is that desire and that hope and that love. And that is a beautiful moment, probably for me one of the most transformative moments of my visits. Mashallah. And in this blessed land, you're also told that you have to, on a special spiritual journey, that you have to really um, understand equality and brotherhood and sisterhood, the way it was meant to be understood by God. And in, the ch in chapter 22 of the Qur'an, God says, And proclaim among men the pilgrimage. They shall come to you on foot and upon every lean beast. They shall come from every deep divine. Here, the Hajj, we find, is a very um, special gathering where people come from all areas and witness something that is unavailable in their homeland. Recently, just last weekend, my family and I traveled vacation and my children finally had the opportunity to experience Universal Studios. <laughs> and it was a very, um, you know, they have these little sections <laughs> where they recreate certain towns and certain areas and certain movie sets and, and all the rest. And we walked through what would have been San Francisco. <laughs> my little son said, Mom, Mom, it's, it's Monterey. <laughs> and I thought it was so interesting that he connected, this little five-year-old kind of connected the fact that we had walked through what looks like the wharf in Monterey. And that he felt momentarily that he was somehow home. And it dawned on me how as much as they tried to recreate home, you literally had to leave home to really appreciate and understand what home was. And be in this surreal kind of Place and Universal Studios is pretty surreal. <laughs> in this surreal place. 
it is not the perfect example, but it is. it touches on the essence of what it means when you're somewhere where you literally have to uproot from the everyday and what you can't recreate a hajj here. Even though every Islamic school that I know of in hajj season will build a mock Kaaba and will have the kids wear the hajj clothing and will do a mock pilgrimage <laughs> so that they teach the children the rites of the hajj, how it is that you actually do this ritual worship and help, help them really understand and connect with something that seems very, very far away. But nonetheless, you literally have to uproot and leave everything that you know behind to really experience the Hajj. And in that, we'll say that there is a real behavioral transformation that happens, right? That exercising a very strict self-discipline to really understand what is sacred and what is important. And you realize that the rules about Hajj say that even the plants and the birds have rights that you cannot harm or touch anything. Where otherwise, you could pick a fruit off a tree and eat. But in Hajj, everything is, is, uh, has sanctity, and everything is not to be, uh, none of the rights should be violated in any way. Right? So again, you're putting yourself in a completely different uh, function in a way where everyday life would otherwise dictate. The Hajj also has a very rigorous training in self-control. And in that true is a, it too is a, is a transformation. In, the cha in chapter two of the Quran, it says, the pilgrimage is in the well-known months. He that undertakes the duty of pilgrimage during them must abstain from, from ungodliness and from dispute. And whatever good you do, Allah is aware of it. Take provision, for yourselves, for the best provision is piety. This idea of taking provision, the scholars have talked about at length. What does that actually mean, to take provision? And they've said that this really shows the extent of conduct that Muslims need to undertake. That afterwards, they should be able to come back from the hedge and mirror the same transformation and keep on the same transformation that they felt when they went to the Hajj. That this idea of piety being the best provision means that you should come back from Hajj more pious and keep that in place. I have to say that one time I had a, um, a, a, lady, a, um, uh, a lady who owned a hair salon. And when I met her, it was post-Hajj. But I heard from her that the reason she made her hair salon all women's only was so that she could service the woman who wore hijab. Because otherwise you can't go into a hair salon, right? So it has to be an all women's space. And she herself, after she went to Hajj, decided to put on the hijab. Which apparently, for her, from the family and background in which she came from, was a really big deal. And for her um, career, as someone in the beauty field, right, it's not, was also a very big deal, right? Somebody who was who was very was very very concerned with the outward at all times. And here was a spiritual transformation. And she says, every time my business kind of starts to take a nosedive, and people say to me, you should open it up again for both men and women to serve, you know, to have more people come through so your business does better. She says, but I'm a hedgie, <laughs> right? Her personal transformation was to make a decision that she really wanted to service, that she herself wanted to take on this next stage of the commandments of God, which is for the woman to cover. And although that was difficult for her, it was a decision she made after her hedge. She came back with that piety and wanted to continue with it. It didn't make sense, she said, it did not make sense for me to go to hedge and to dawn <clears throat> all of the scar, and then to come back and leave it, right? So a transformation that takes place, and in this case, affected even her career, right, and her daily livelihood. The Hajj also has a social function, a social transformation, and this I'm going to spend a few more minutes on because I think it's very powerful. Here we find that the Quran says, and proclaim among men the pilgrimage and they should come from every deep, every deep, um, ravine. Here we see that this discussion, that the social gathering of people in the Hajj, 
And what does that mean? Because the, the, the ayah or the verse continues to say, and they shall witness things that benefit them and mention the name of Allah. The benefits. The word benefit in this verse. What does that mean? For pilgrims to derive the experience of Hajj and from them, for themselves and for their countries and for humans, right? The human condition. That the Hajj could really, with good planning, actually guarantee that humans later can live effectively without discord. If the lessons taught in Hajj could really be transformed on a social level thereafter, outside of Hajj. The benefits are numerous, perennial, and they're capable to really increase and, and even be tailored to different individuals. Every person that has gone to Hajj has come back with a different story of how it's affected them. Every pilgrimage is different for every person. But what is true of everybody is that they they're actually are transformed when they come back. But in a social, when we talk about the social situation here, when you look at groups and organizations, systems and governments and countries, think about all of these coming in and congregating in one space. Think about what happens when you bring, um, think about it almost like a conference or a convention in which the time and the venue has been set by God. And that the invitation is open to anybody and everybody who is Muslim. And no one has the power to bar anyone from coming in. And any attempt to debar a Muslim from coming in would be to do what God calls one of the most heinous crimes. Right? To be able to, to say, you can't come in, even though a person proclaims a man Muslim. So here we find that the verse that says that Hajj is a, is a, is a sanctuary for humankind really is the case. And here every Muslim is guaranteed safety and freedom, as long as they don't violate its safety. Right? And the Quran says in chapter 3 that whoever enters it is safe. And now you have this congress or convention conference of people, almost like a mini Muslim nation. But in that little nation, you have a very unique situation, a really unique opportunity for global unity. Because you have all people of all backgrounds, of all languages, of all ethnicities, and of all social economic levels. Yet they're there, all seeking the same thing, that connection with God. And they're all taken away from anything that's considered to be unique about them or individualistic about them is shed. And the decision makers and rulers that otherwise sit in their ivory towers are called down to be with the masses. And even they are shoulder to shoulder with the lay people. And you can't distinguish one from the other. When this happens, when the people from the towers of authority mingle with the ordinary folk in complete equality in front of God, you have the ability of real social transformation. You have the ability to really understand what the people on the ground are dealing with. And the people on the ground have the ability to finally understand, too, what people in places of decision making that are often, that's often very complicated and convoluted also are going through. And together, you can start having a dialogue of a, of a unique sort that doesn't happen anywhere else. And here in this tremendous assembly that Hajj is, you find the great benefit that God is, social in this case, benefit that God is referring to in the verse. And this unity could really be seen as what we call, the, where the, we said in the earlier verse, the provision, right, that's being asked of us, right, to take back with us. This provision, then, is what Muslims take back from visiting the house of God. And that their unity is really the starting, you can say, can be the starting and the finishing point for their journey that they've taken. And a real benefit for having visited the house of God and being shoulder to shoulder with all the rest of humanity. And that piety that they come back with, and we hope that we keep, right, ongoing, really can be um, transformative in all the different levels. And I've only spoken of four today, but really, if we talk about it, there's so many different facets of transformation that can happen. 
but we are almost out of time. And so we'll kind of stay to those four facets and say that there is a beautiful, um, really the beautiful journey of Hajj that, ca that causes, a, if we can recap quickly what we said earlier, that really causes a person to sit down with themselves and figure out where they need to be, where they're lacking, where they may have angered people, what debts they may owe, and is this the right time? Are there any dependents, whether they be small children or elderly parents? And financially, if they are truly stable enough, financially stable enough to take on this journey. And if all the checks, if you check off every box, then you must go. And that is where you find the Muslim feeling, I need to go, I need to get there, I need to get there, right? And this real desire that after a person goes once that they want to return, because you think after an arduous journey, would you ever go back? And almost always a Muslim will say, I really want to go back. And this time I even want to intend my pilgrimage for my mother who couldn't have, who didn't go, or my father who's now deceased, right? You even intend it for other people. You'll take on the journey, this arduous journey, even for the sake of others, because you wish they could have gotten with you. Right? So it's a beautiful and very transformative process, but like God speaks to us here and says, it must be these benefits and provisions in piety must be retained even after we return, and in that we'll find both individual and societal transformation. Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure to speak to you today.